I, I welcome you to this uh, session on governance, to this introductory session on governance. I am Pierre Amel uh, from the University of Montreal. I will be chairing that session. We have two speakers. We will start with uh, Christopher Neat. Uh, Christopher is uh, Assistant Professor of Applied Social Research in the Department of Sociology at Ofstra of University in New York. He is also the Academic Director of the National Center for Suburban Studies at the same university. The title of his talk is Creative Destruction and Political Struggle in the Suburban United States. Uh, welcome, uh, Christopher. Thank you, Pierre. Um, so I want to thank uh, everyone for coming and to Roger and to the Global Suburbanisms Group for inviting me. I want to thank particularly the staff and the coordinators who are you know, dealing with a thousand crises simultaneously so that many of us don't even know that those crises existed. So thank you to, to both the, you know, the organizers and the staff. Thank you. So today I'm going to offer a few comments about the redevelopment of the United States suburbs and about the little boomlet of publications that we've had around on the theme of the end of the suburbs in the U.S. Um, and I want to start by saying that actually I was a little anxious when I was preparing this presentation because I submitted the title and then I found out that I was going to be in the governance section. And the, the ANTS, the ANC on the end of governance always makes me a little anxious, a little antsy. And I think it's because when I hear the word governance, I usually think of something like this, right? I mean, you have kind of like, the boardroom, the, here's the more modern version, um, the very diverse, uh, in this case, board of directors from Duke Energy, but you know, kind of, so I visualize a process in which homogenous and multiple, often multiply privileged social actors, many of them either affiliated with capital or with capital's most reliable allies in the public or nonprofit sectors, arrogate to themselves decision-making powers that more properly belong to a much broader public. Now, sometimes these groups are, you know, the folks who participate in governance are better intentioned or less well intentioned. They might have different visions of what constitutes the public good. Um, and they may deal with uh, external challenges from civil society, either by co opting those civil so society groups or by ignoring them altogether. But in any of these cases, governance is a word, in my experience, that's used, often used by elites um, to describe a process run by elites. Um, now, if this seems kind of like a little bit overbroad, I should explain that my pessimism about the concept of governance stems with my first encounter with governance while studying regionalism in the United States. And there the word, words seem to signal a retreat from the robust policy making of the 1960s and 70s. Um, these were initiatives that were not without their problems, but at their best, they included some very progressive types of uh, social policy, like trying to you know, use the, leverage the power of the federal government to desegregate the suburbs, extend public transportation, and so on. Um, and it was for that reason that these regionalist initiatives of the 60s and 70s were subject to systematic dismantling under the Nixon and later Reagan administrations. So it's not surprising that when, reg when regionalism reemerged in the United States in the 1990s, it seemed, much of it at least, and I'm gonna qualify this in a second, seemed like a more chastened and modest thing. The goals were more modest in many respects. Uh, cities and suburbs could uh, enter into joint purchasing agreements with one another, and they could forge public and private partnerships with capital to attract external investment. But to the extent that civil society groups were involved in that regional governance, um, they seldom successfully advanced anything like a, a robust social justice agenda. Uh, that would challenge the kind of the core elite um, prerogatives of these groups. So, having said that, I'll, I'll kind of back up a little bit. Uh oh, okay. And I'll say that to, to start my talk with this provocation is kind of unfair to the you know to the global suburbanisms group because I, from what I've you know read, their, what's on their website, what they've produced, it seems like they're very much concerned about this tension within governance. In fact, the definition on the website. Um, notes that they, uh oh, have my, I'm supposed to have my timer here, and of course it's blanking out, okay. Um, so they just, the way that they define governance, it includes um, efforts to regulate suburban development that, that involve state, market, and civil society actors and implies democratic deliberation and social conflict. So within the global suburbanism's approach, there's, there's room uh, 
uh, f to take account of political struggle. And I would even suggest that a normative inclination to kind of welcome uh, political struggle and social conflict. Um, reflecting a more pessimistic you know, or, or cautious approach, I, I cite here the uh, passage from Eric Swingedal's Governance Innovation in the Citizen article from Urban Studies, where he picks up on a lot of tensions within governance. So on the one hand, uh, governance might promise democratization, and yet also we often see, but yet we also often see uh, tendencies towards autocracy and technocracy. Um, we see this interest in expanding the range of shareholders, well, at the same time a consolidation of organized interest groups. And then we see a promise for greater transparency and, uh, transparency and, um, and accountability that is not necessarily realized when we combine the uh, superficial kind of horizontality of governance structures with their, um, their actual verticality, I could say. So these are, oh good. So these two approaches to governance, are, they're, they're kind of two flavors. There's one that's more optimistic and really um, kind of embraces social conflict and political struggle, and one that's uh, maybe more cautious and is worried about the autocratic and non-democratic non uh, dimensions of, of governance. We could also say that one is more, perhaps more oriented towards um, equity and towards redistribution, the first, and the, the latter is worried that, the, that those, again, that. Uh, governance will, actually, will have regressive or inequitable outcomes. So I was thinking about calling these governance one and two, but then I decided I didn't want to say governance one and two throughout the, um, throughout the talk. So instead I'm going to call them uh, uh, mint chocolate chip uh, governance and rum raisin governance. For the obvious reason that mint chocolate chip ice cream is the, the flavor of an idyllic future, and rum raisin is the flavor of a bleak dystopian nightmare. <laughs> so, um, so okay. So we have these two flavors of governance, and distinguishing between them is particularly important at this moment in the suburbs. In part because we're kind of we stand on the threshold of reinventing the suburbs, or many people are talking about rebuilding the suburbs. Um, and this kind of brings me to the the altered title of my talk, um, which is. I, at the beginning, I added this "all that is solid, melt, you know, all that is suburban melts into air" uh, title, which is partly a, a homage to Marshall Berman, who recently passed away, um, and who wrote one of my favorite books uh, in college and then later in adulthood as a professor, which is "All that is solid melts into air." Um, many folks in this room are, I'm sure, familiar with the book. Um, for those who aren't, the, you know, and I'm summarizing here, and you really need to read it to get a sense of just how beautiful this this book is. Uh, it starts with Berman's treatment, uh, um, kind of a widescreen discussion of the history of modernity and modernism. And then he takes us through a couple different uh, figures. He looks at Goethe's Faust, he looks at Baudelaire, he looks at Dostoevsky, and he finally ends with the figure of Robert Moses in New York, um, who in a Faustian way is transforming, transforming the landscape of, of New York City, building you know, parks, playgrounds, uh, housing projects, and perhaps most of all expressways, ramming them through um, neighborhoods and places like the Bronx. And so, you know, it, it, at the end of the chapter, uh, Berman comes back to his own biography and describes how his neighborhood in the Bronx was one of the ones that was destroyed by Moses. Um, and really, he tries to, he, he discusses his ambivalence about modernism generally. On the one hand, kind of the awe at modernism's creations and the, the hopes that modernism might give us for improving our, um, you know, for, for liberation, for improving standards of living, you know, these kind of broad utopian visions of modernism with um, the reality of, of modernity and the lives of people living in New York City. So there's this ambivalence, ambivalence there. And, I'm, and I think that now what we're seeing is we're seeing the beginnings of an effort to rebuild the suburbs. Um, this has really emerged kind of to the forefront of, um, uh, well, I guess one more, one more thing to say about this before I move on, is that uh, Robert Moses, uh, of course, wasn't just building in New York City, he was also building in places like Long Island, in the suburbs of Long Island. So the suburbs that began in the Bronx were just stretching out across, just stretching out into the suburbs. And that's where Hofstra is, in the, in the New York City suburbs. And what we're seeing now is this effort to rebuild the suburbs, which is in some ways kind of unraveling, uh, unraveling Moses' work. If the expressways of 
Long Island were kind of the warp of, of the suburban fabric that the developers wove. We're now in the process of unraveling that. At the national level, we're also starting to see more discussion of the, the possible end of the suburbs. So we've had a number of uh, major, recent major um, best-selling publications in the, in the US, uh, best-selling books. I put here um, Alan Arnault's uh, Great Inversion, Lee Gallagher's End of the Suburbs. We can also add, in some ways, Edward Glazer's um, The Triumph of the City. Um, I'm going to spend a couple minutes talking about these books and what's you know, interesting and, and a little problematic. Um, so we have this, a lot of discussion at the, the end of the suburbs. I've also, I have to put up the requisite arcade fire quote, as well as pictures of the uh, vacant subdivisions left behind from the foreclosure crisis. And the story that these books tell are, is in some ways based upon literatures that many of the people in this room know well, that social scientists and planners have been producing for for, for several years. And this is a very you know, cursory overview of those literatures and very incomplete lists of who've, who've been involved in them. Uh, but this has been the research on suburban decline. Um, and I've kind of fit, fit it into three, three categories. The first category being um, the body of literature on suburban policy and, uh, that's more based on suburban policy and planning and that really kind of tracks the arc of suburban decline over time, tries to um, trace the, the causes that are driving it. Um, then there's a body of literature that's come from the equity regionalists. So these are folks who since the 90s have kind of broke with the, suburb, the regional governance crowd and instead are favoring a uh, form of regional governments that's much more um, based upon um, the power of social movements and redistribution within, within regions in the US. And then a third group of writers who have been focused more on architecture design um, and planning and ways of retrofitting the suburbs or rebuild, rebuilding them to often to make them more sustainable. So if these uh, writers have, th so these writers have, have examined both suburban decline, the initial efforts to rebuild the suburbs and also responses to, to those efforts. And much of this research is picked up in these mainstream books. So what are the drivers of decline? Well, there are many of the factors listed here that, again, are kind of commonplace within this growing literature. We have demographic shifts, such as uh, an aging population. People were aging in place in these older US suburbs. Um, changes in family structure, the, the rise of single living, documented by folks like Eric Kleinenberg. A growing poor population in the, in the suburbs. Fiscal challenges faced by these very fragmented local governments in the US. Shifting consumption and lifestyle practices rather than the suburban house being appealing. Now urban living or urbanized living, uh, denser living is becoming more appealing. And then the, there are the environmental pressures, uh, both related to climate change, um, uh, I guess growth limits or the regulation of suburban expansion. Um, and in some cases, like Long Island, um, a greater sense of environmental vulnerability in the wake of events like Hurricane Sandy. Okay. Oh, oh rats. Okay. Oh. So, uh, all right. Rearranging. Something got rearranged, so I'm rearranging in my head. So, <laughs> Uh, so the, these two, both the, the academic work and the, these recent mainstream publications are in some ways very similar. They tell very s similar stories and narratives. Um, but they're different in one key way. And I would say that the, the, much of this literature on suburban decline, I think does, um, I, so they're, they're, they're similar both in terms of the narratives that they tell and also in terms uh, of the, of the goal, some of the goals they set, one of which is that we should be moving towards more urbanized suburban living if we want the suburbs to, be, to, have, a, to have a future. But the difference in part is the way both of these, the way these two groups of literature try to get there, the means to the, the urbanized end, end, if you will. And I would say that many of, much of the academic literature does make a place, does have a place for social struggle. Certainly the equity regionalists advocate 
you know, that for, for instance, the development of labor community coalitions that will place demands on developers as they rebuild the suburbs. Um, you know, environmental justice groups which bond together to kind of advance their, their, um, their interests in, within this atmosphere of suburban redevelopment. And even the, even the groups here who are not really equity regionalist writers, I think that that, that sort of orientation is in, implicit in a lot of their, in a lot of their writing. Um, and so this group of writers I tend to associate somewhat with the, you know, the mint chocolate chip version of, of governance for that reason. Uh, whereas these writers are, I would say, are a bit more rum reason. And let me say a little bit more about that. So one, one example of the, the way that they're rum reason, I, I want to focus here for a moment on, uh, on uh, this debate between Ed Glazer and, and Joel Kotkin. So uh, Joel Kotkin, as many people know, is a real um, suburban booster and is very much not part of this end of the suburbs discourse and doesn't think that the, um, that the pause in suburban growth and that the suburban malaise that followed the recession is going to be something of longstanding. He thinks it's a kind of a temporary aberration. And once we're back to normalcy, suburban expansion and development will continue because that's what people want and that's what people love. And so there was this debate between Edward Glazer, who has really been promoting densification and densification within the city, about whether policy generally should, should encourage densification. And this argument played out in you know, two of my favorite publications, the City Journal published by the Manhattan Institute in New York, a conservative think tank, and then the, you know, uh, the, the American, which is the publication of the American Enterprise Institute. Um, but the, the debate was, should policy encourage densification? And Kotkin argued, no, suburbanites prefer sprawl, and that's what they should be allowed to, to have. And Glazer emphasized that, um, that densification should be promoted by reducing land use restrictions um, on redevelopment in cities and having folks in the cities kind of stand aside as, their, as the urban fabric. And in some cases, the suburban fabric is remade. So it's a strange choice, right? I mean, in both cases, we're really relying upon, relying upon the market and relying upon elite developers and, and consumers to decide where the suburbs are moving, where suburb suburban governance you know, that we're relying on them, on them essentially to govern the suburbs for us. Um, and Glazer's, Glazer's approach, kind of new, expanded and somewhat nuanced in the book-length version, The Triumph of the City, is also kind of typical of the Alan Ehrenholt and Lee Gallagher approach, in that the solutions to the problem of the suburbs, the way that we're going to re-urbanize the suburbs, remake the suburban fabric, is that we're going to have consumers that are acting out of their cha changing tastes for more urbanized living and out of the fiscal necessity of not being able to buy $6 gas and commute from far-flung suburbs. We'll have enlightened de developers that respond to those preferences, enlightened architects and community builders who have adopted the kind of a new urbanist gospel and are, are densifying suburban space. And we'll have a government that provides man tra mass transit, removes incentives for sprawl, and then more or less gets out of the way. So this is, again, kind of the limited rum raisin version of, version of governance. This isn't a, a, a vision of governance that really has much to say about political participation or even about the distributional effects of suburban redevelopment. Um, and there are a couple of problems with it. I think that in some ways the empirical problem is that it's, it's, that approach, I think, is going to be surprised or isn't going to have much to say about the social conflict that's going to attend the remaking of suburban space and the suburban redevelopment. Um, so when eminent domain is used to clear non-vacant uh, residential and commercial uses, um, I think there's going to be social conflict. When suburban redevelopment takes place within suburbs that are already riven by race and class um, divisions, it, there's going to be social conflict. When political representation in suburbs lags behind the demographic change that have already taken place, which we see on Long Island, which is becoming more and more racial, racially and ethnic, ethnically diverse, but still has eight white male Republican state senators to re represent it, we're going to see, we're going to see some level of social conflict. And I also say that more, norm, um, more normatively, it's, it's, we need to think about this political struggle because it's, it's going to be very hard to ensure that suburban development is equitable and is per participatory for a couple different reasons. Um, I think that we often see, in many suburbs, relatively low organizational capacity, especially among progressive 
movements and groups. We see, uh, frankly, weak funding commitments, both from foundations and in the few cases that these community organizations can get funding from states, also from states. We see governmental fragmentation, which makes it hard to organize um, groups at the local and regional level. And we even see within the groups and within the residents of these communities um, sort of a, a narrow ideological um, identification with market rate home ownership, which makes it difficult to promote affordable housing even in areas that are experiencing economic decline, where more and more people who live there are renter households rather than owners. Um, and that could really benefit from a range of um, housing options. So very briefly, uh, I mean, this has really come home to me in, in two projects, um, redevelopment projects that are right near Hofstra's campus in the village of Hempstead, where developers are planning on um, destroying a, uh, uh, hundreds of acres of downtown um, space, existing space, both which both include occupied businesses and occupied um, apartment buildings, and then rebuilding this kind of new urbanist vision on the, on the top right, the, the uh, Hempstead Renaissance. And then on the bottom, the Nassau Hub, which is vacant, mostly commercial space, uh, immediately adjacent to Hofstra's campus. And where far Sidney Ratner, the same developer that, um, that built Atlantic Yards, is now planning a, a new arena. Um, and in both cases, I only have a couple minutes, so this is going to be abbreviated, but I can talk about it more in the, in the Q&A. Um, you had, there were community coalitions that came together and fought, in the case of Hempstead, the village of Hempstead, for more affordable housing so that the people who were displaced by eminent domain could, could return to the community, fought for more affordable housing in that project and lost. In the case of Nassau, the Nassau Hub, um, community groups that are now fighting currently, like this, this very week, for more community benefits for the surrounding, uh, the surrounding neighborhoods and seem to be, and are having a hard time. They've experienced a number of setbacks. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's, that's all I'm gonna say about that for now. Um, so what are, the, what are the things that are hopeful here? Well, a couple little, I have to give some glimmers of hope. So um, I think that, one thing that's hopeful is we're starting to see more and more act activists and academics import these, you know, these concepts like the right to the city and at least a year or two of the Occupy movement into the suburbs um, and also rediscover the, some of the progressive or radical histories that have been kind of buried within the U.S. suburbs. Um, I think that we're starting to see on the design end more participatory uh, design. It, folks like Joan, June Williamson writing about creating um, suburban public spaces, which are not just about maximizing the uh, effects of commercial redevelopment, but also about providing a space for political expression and for dissent. Um, we're starting to see uh, national and local organizing campaigns like the Building One America campaign that have, are kind of coalescing around a resurgent equity regionalism. Um, okay, and then I think with that, I just want to I want to end again back with uh, with Marshall Berman, um, who has this you know this vision at, in the final page of his of his book. I mean, he describes the the 1960s and how the 1960s pr provided an opportunity both to you know it was the time when you know Moses was stopped in his tracks, and there was this moment where um, the the social movements of the 60s were. We're envisioning, as he writes here, a, a new synth that a new synthesis might someday be born, a new mode of modernity through which we could all harmoniously move and which we could feel at home. And although, you know, he, he then goes on to describe how many of those hopes were dashed in the 1970s, I would suggest here or leave, leave you with the thought that we're standing at a similar moment in suburban history uh, where we're both, uh, there's this moment of both great danger where we could you know, we're confronted by the danger of this rum raisin governance, the reconstruction of the suburbs from the top down in a potentially inequitable way, but it's also a mo mo movement of opportunity where, you know, with, if, you know, if we support these uh, grassroots suburban movements and see how we can contribute to in expanding their capacity, it could also be a moment for um, excitement and change and a more, the development of more progressive and environmentally sustainable suburb. That's it. Emmanuel Brunet-Jailly, 
who is associate professor at the School of Public Administration at the University of Victoria, where he is co-director of the Local Government Institute and director of the European Union Center of Excellence. The title of his presentation is Formal and Informal Governance of Territories, Normative Implications. Emmanuel. So I was saying that I use the I use basically the case of the Grand Paris as the bookend for my presentation. And the reason I focused on this is because I, I, as a, one of my hobbies, I look at Paris and I read about Paris. I've read, for instance, you know, all of Haussmann's work and so on and so forth. I'm going to get started now. And I think it's a very interesting case because it's one of those traditional um, location, community, uh, that you know, for centuries basically has been a model of uh, Western and certainly for the, for the European continental forms of government of, of large cities. And I think therefore it's really interesting that uh, Sarkozy and it's working um, said that we didn't need any governance for a 35 billion euros project which is called the Grand Paris. So I start in this talk um, with the idea that, and I'm going to time myself if I manage to, to get this to work, thank you, um, by saying, by using this poem, which has, I really like, I've already used it, I think, once at a talk, which is uh, the city here complete, the idea that we can have the ideal city. And this idea that really um, we should be very cautious with perfect theories of governance and what you know, the governance of suburbs should be and how these things should work. Because really what matters here is um, that we need to understand that diversity, that complexity, that asymmetry that is developing in the current very large urban regions and suburbs. Um, and that uh, with Jane Jacob, obviously, all of this comes from dance mixed neighborhood that give life to cities. Um, now, if we look at Paris, on this map, you have the ancient walls of Paris, and you can see, actually, you can see, okay, I thought this would work. Can you see it? Yeah. You can see the different walls of Paris at different periods. So here you have the 11th century wall, here you have the Grand Boulard wall, you have the, the, the wall of the uh, 16th century, and you have basically the current existence of Paris. And I'm asking uh, us to think about it this way. We are, what are we talking about? Are we talking about rule? Are we talking about government? Are we govern talking about governance? Are we talking about regulation, which is even more, much more loose than governance? Are we talking about some form that take into account representation of politics of place? And you can see that there is some overlap with the talk we've just had. And I use a quote from um, Stuart Eldon, most recent book was just published, The Birth of Territory, where he says that territory is not just bounded space, in other words, a boundary around a, you know, a, a, a space, uh, but it is um, not only just a bordered po power container, which is basically the way we've looked at this, and this is what I'm going to be discussing with you, but a political technology. And that I believe that today, when we are looking at rule, governance, multi-level governance, governance issues about cities and suburbs, what we are looking at is basically that political technology and how it's evolving. So the current Paris uh, project that you can see here is, you know, the, the old city of Paris in the 75, which is the département of Paris as well. And then you've got what they call the small couronne, the small crown, and then you've got the region of, of uh, Ile de France here. And the project of the Grand Paris uh, we, you can see Paris here, a 35 billion transportation pro project basically broaches and, and straddles across all of those different constituencies, making it a huge uh, conundrum from the perspective of who decides and, who, and basically what city are we building when we are spending that kind of money and, and allowing that kind of uh, public-private partnership to develop. And I asked the question in the terms that are asked and basically highlighted by um, our colleagues, Eckerd, Hamill, and Kale in, 
governing suburbia, which is, is it the, city, is it the state city? Is it the market city or is it the privatized city? And so what kind of governance form, what kind of rule do we want here for this to work? And my contention here is that uh, if we're asking whose city is it, it has huge imp uh, normative implications uh, for the form of rule that we have in place, whether it's a regulatory form, whether it's a government, or whether it's something in between, or whether there is no regulatory form whatsoever. Um, and I think this is, you know, if it's my precious city, then I cannot ignore the governance form, and I have to look at the rule form carefully. Um, and I have a picture here of um, the citizen of Paris in 1871 destroying the, the old city hall of Paris, which was rebuilt, the one that you can visit uh, today has it's, it's been rebuilt. In other words, it's a, st it's a political statement. I was going to show the, the video clip, but for technological reasons, I'm not gonna show it, but at the end of his 44, 45 minutes talk, when he launched the Grand Paris, Nicolas Sarkozy is telling all the elected officials that are in the room in, in front of him at the Cité des Sciences in Paris that no governance is needed and that after him and after his lifetime, maybe once they, have, they are used to implementing complex projects, they can think about the governance of the projects. In other words, there is no politics in this. Is there no politics in this? So the, the, the talk I have here is a quick overview of the transform, tra transformation of territories, and then I review the literature on power, politics, governance. I discuss formal and informal governance, and I, it's basically a claim, this, this talk is basically a plea for us to study a lot more informal governance so that you, we understand better the kind of transformation that are taking place today. And the kind of transformation that are taking place today, I think are, it's very important to see this from a very broad perspective, so I put it this way. If we look at the international re relation literature, uh, since the creation of the un United Nations, we have the creation of a multitude of states, more than one per year around the world. So a fairly small community of states has basically added states every year. Territory is fragmenting from an international relation perspective. This is also a international relation rule system, right? That is imposing, that is recognizing this fragmentation. At the same time, boundaries, international boundaries, are becoming much more precise. Not only do we create new boundaries in Europe, right, but at the same time, we also delineate boundaries much more precisely because we have the technological capacity to do this. At the same time, what we have is a process that is a top-down process where existing states have basically decentralized power to lower-level governments lower level constituencies in various different forms, right? But basically there is a decentralization process. And they also upscale their governments. In other words, there are amalgamations and mergers that are going on in many different OECD and European states, for instance. So the bird's view is that when we look at this from the IR perspective, their states are confronted with a politics of, of place. People want to control what is going on in the spaces that they occupy and where they live. It's the indigenous claims in Canada, for instance, right? It's also the Occupy movement. And the city's, views, the city's view is that new states, decentralization, merger and amalgamation, increase the political clout of the local. This is seeing the city, seeing, seeing um, the perspective from the city's view. Um, and at the same time, market and privatization are obviously also furthering that process. And obviously we're faced with this, a huge demography of, of cities, right? 45 of, of 450 cities have population of one, more than 1 million, and we've got 10 today that are more than 10 million, up to 35 and, and so on, and 54, 53, 54 percent of the world population lives in cities. So can we have no politics in all of this? Now, when we look at the literature, um, Saskia Sassen 
um, argues that um, legal re regimes unbundled, uh, unbundled sovereignties, denationalized territories. And this has repercussion for uh, um, redistributive justice and equity. Brenner talks about state spaces, and he, he, he uh, basically explained how all of this recalibrate territory. Keating talks about multinational states and highlights asymmetry of rights across territories within federated states. And Manuel Castell wrote, and I, I quote, the space of flows links up distant locales around shared functions and meanings on the basis of electronic circuits and fast transportation corridors while isolating and subduing the logic of experience embodied in the space of places. In other words, there is here some form of contention and difficulties going on between the two types of flows. So when we sum up the literature, what we have here is an array of reasons as to why territories are being remodeled and transformed and why we should worry about governance. Multi-level governance, and this is what the literature tells us, is a way to understand this transformation. Governance is also a way to, to understand this transformation. Decentralization is a way to understand also what has happened within some of the containers and in relation to, to different levels of governments, basically, whether it's the international and the national, or whether it's the national and, and the regional or the local. One of the things that we know is that asymmetries are developing, and that if we want to understand the new governance forms, we have to look at these asymmetries and their, and their normative implications. Now, when we look at these asymmetries and when we want to understand this, we need to look back at the political economy literature, basically, that looks at the social construction of local economies and the politics of space, basically. The origin of this literature, the community power theories, I think is a really interesting place to start here, in, indeed, because it talks to us about the relative importance of the agency of places, local politics. Originally, these discussions started with the idea that power was about function or power was about reputation. And then we have the work of Dow that talks about power as a process of amalgamation of local claims where leaders are attempting to gain position in political offices. And we have the work of Marxists and public choice that are basically together arguing that market forces, central governments, are structurally and structural constraints on local communities. The whole debate here, however, unravels and that basically um, scholars have finally, in the end of this discussion, scholars have agreed that was, what was fundamental here was that local actors were actually important agents and that there was no such things as market or political constraints. Um, Stone in regime politics, I think, basically turns around the whole discussion when he argues that the local power emerges out of local politics. So the, the conundrum for me then is to understand what local politics is all about if we know that local power emerges out of local politics and that it can be compounded to actually transform and modify the influence of both states or markets. So politics in the literature can be identified, for instance, as the result of a performance or an efficacy. Efficiency, it's a problem-solving activity. It's a process that results from um, place-based mediation of conflict, or it's in between. It's the capacity to link and transform local claims across regions and spaces. And basically, if we want to understand politics, we have to rally with this idea that it's the ability to marshal all sources of power while limiting the influence of opposing forces. It is the articulation of those forces into multiple levels of government. It is the capacity, basically, to organize this through institutions or through networks that are themselves being transformed today. 
And so we have to talk about governance of go or, or government. In um, local government in the global world, Ma uh, John Martin and I basically agreed that we should use the UNDP um, definition for governance. And the, we, we, we state that it is, or we, we quote specifically that it is the exercise of economic, political, and administrative authority to manage a country's affair at all levels, and it comprises mechanisms and process and institutions through which citizens and groups articulate their interests, exercise their legal rights, and meet their obligation to mediate their difference. And obviously, this is a norm, to a certain extent normative because it assumes that is good governance. Obviously, we tend here to ignore the idea that maybe this is not. Um, the fundamental question is that we would like to know what good governance is, but that we're dealing with many forms of governance, none of, not all of which are good governance. I'll pass on this. When we look at the governance literature specifically today, there are basically four different forms of governments and governance that are used to understand what is going on is in large urban regions. You've got the traditional metropolitan government, the old regionalism, which basically focuses on efficiency and, and, and effectiveness. And in such a case, um, policies reach the largest number at the lowest possible cost. And it is policy and it is politics and power exercised within a bounded territory that is democratically accountable to a community of electors, those that elect government. When we talk about governance, however, we have a slightly different focus, which is that of equity and competitiveness. And the organized principle is also a bounded territory. However, accountability and responsiveness are not uniquely in the end of electors, but they also include public and private stakeholders. Government shares policymaking with others. When you look at decentralization in France, basically, in the 1990s, the late 1990s rules basically recognized that fact at the regional level. The prefect's authority and the prefect's Mandates are refocused on defending the state's position when faced with other stakeholders. Now, when we look at the third model, rescaling and reterritorialization, what we have here is that the whole idea is that the region has to be included in global competition as well. In other words, we not do we not only have a regional scale, but we also have an international uh, scale that comes in, in play here. And therefore, the stakeholders are also internationalized and the forces at play much larger as well. It's local, global cooperation, interest groups, communities, and stakeholders that are acting on the city. And then there is the public choice literature, which basically argues that rational actors have very limited, if any, incentive to cooperate. So these four different views basically are the different models that we have, are different abstract models that we have to understand the forms of rules that are managing and governing our cities today. Some, I argue here, are more or less accountable to the people. They're more or less accountable and responsive to local communities. Others are more or less accountable and responsive to very specific um, recipient of services that may be industries, that may be large stakeholders, that may be specific type of industries. Some have a logic that is basically a local politics of place. There are written or inscribed in the community and the territory itself. Others have a logic that is a market-based logic, a flows logic that has nothing to do with the territory itself. So when we look at suburban governance, we are looking at this conflict. We are looking at basically what we could call war zones between different forms of governance or what it happens when the forms of governance that are in place vary as they do. 
And here I basically summarize what I've just said very briefly. We have issues of intergovernmental issues, we have issues of networks, and we have multi-level governance. I'm going to pass on this because of time. So how does this connect with informal governance? What I'm arguing here is that we don't understand informal governance as well as we understand governance. For one thing, for instance, we don't understand informal governance when there is very little presence of authority in any given place. When there is no authority or no rule on a given territory, which is the case in a number of cities around the world, or limited rule, for instance, regulatory or what, um, we are in situations where we have to question the models that we have. Thank you. So informal governance is understanding that there is informal influence that takes place behind closed doors. This can be seen as the hidden hand of the mafia or of corruptions. It can be seen also simply of the, as the hidden hand of key decision makers that refuse to discuss things in public or make it clear. It is the shadow side dynamic of an organization, whether it's a small organization, private, whereas it's large organization, public, whether it's a state or a public or a non-listed, non-public corporation. So the literature on informal governance notes that there is a juxtaposition just here between the formal and the informal and formal and informal decision making. But there is also an interdependence which has tremendous normative issues, issues of democracy and issues of democratic accountability. And North, for instance, argues that the scholarship only looks at 10% of the visible tip of the iceberg of ongoing social processes that is borne by 90% of the in invisible ice. So the literature today only differentiates between formal and informal structures and processes in strides, yet central states, federal states, are being challenged not only by local regional actors, but also it is spaces of flows and the multiple trans-state actors, market forces, and privatized interests that are the challenge. So this is central. Originally, institutions are territorially grounded, formal, and emerge from a rational driving, unify a unifying will. There is the normative implication here. There is a huge normative implication. In which we assume that individuals or individual will is being socialized into a common. And where that deviants are assumed to need more socialization. In other words, the contemporary tension is about the governance of these individuals, international uh, agent with varied socialized background. Not a territorial logic, but a fluid logic. A, flu a logic of flows. Market forces and privatized agent. The public choice views already recognize that tension. And recognize that in that tension, individuals were seeking a utility and a morality. These are ideas articulated by Leonor Ostrom, for instance, but also Abernas in public relations, a general mobile proposition. However, in grammar of, of institution, Crawford and Ostrom suggest that individuals developed a cooperative behavior in pursuit of their individual interest. Majorities combine the coordinated and conflicting pursuits of individual interests with general adjustments. So in conclusion, what I want to say is that heated political discussions have always been about the common good. 
and the public will, which have been served by formal institutions. And we know that they have some normative implications. But this basically is the core issue with suburban governance, because it is at the crossroad of both what is formal and informal governance here. To refer to Castell's words, market and privatized logic link up, and I use his own words here, links up distant locals around shared functions and meanings on the basis of electronic circuits and fast transportation corridors, while isolating and subduing the territorial logic of experience embodied in spaces, places. Uh, in the end, I'm asking, is it the end of territorial politics, where territory is not just bounded space or the local state a bordered power container, but a political technology it's a political technology alongside um, which is following a market and privatized logic today, for instance, as it is the case in the Grand Paris. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emmanuel. I think that the, um, the two presenters have raised the interesting question about this notion of governance and we see that the notion is not uh, an easy one to uh, to cope with uh, it is it is a highly contested notion as as we know but still uh, maybe it's a way to uh, um, it's a notion that we can start with to uh, to have a look at the way power uh, uh, relationships are restructured uh, when um, there are a lot of uncertainty, not, not only in the finalities uh, regarding the uh, urban development, but also um, in the values that are involved in, the, in, in, in shaping cities. So, in, in a sense, governance uh, is at stake in many ways. And uh, I, I think that we, we have time for a few comments or questions. Is, is there someone who's raising his hand? Okay, thanks. Well, uh, <clears throat> my question is for Chris, and uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> yours was uh, such a uh, uh, smart and idealistic presentation that I feel like something of a Grinch to point out that there's plenty of participatory democracy in, in the suburbs. There's plenty of community organizing, yeah. but it's all what I would call, strictly speaking, reactionary. Right. NIMBYism, I mean, that's what gets the people out on, literally out on the streets. On the other hand, if you're looking for where uh, what I would call progressive ideas and, and strategies are coming from, it's coming from the governance structure. It's coming from places like the Regional Plan Association of New York and uh, these kinds of top, you know, essentially top-down, academically oriented uh, institutions. So I'll have to admit I'm a little afraid of the uh, democracy you're calling for. No, that's absolutely a fair point, and you're right. I mean, and I, I, I'm sure I wasn't qualifying it enough or explaining that well enough during the presentation, but I mean that, that's that's absolutely right. I mean the, I mean I, I should say you're, I I really agree with your your first point at least. Um, I think that and I think there's actually been a lot of uh, that usually when we think about civic capacity in the suburbs, we're thinking of exactly what you're describing. We're thinking of the NIMBY movements. We're thinking about move, you know efforts to exclude people from um, from suburban neighborhoods. Uh, the the book that I Put a maybe not so subtle plug in for at the end of the at the end of the presentation um, that we just published, Social Justice in the Diverse Suburbs, pulled together a, a set of papers from a conference we had in 2009 that were really about progressive movements in the suburbs. But in in framing those papers, you know, I pointed out that that the, this is exactly what we what we usually think about. This is the in some ways the um, uh, the place that the where the suburbs do have a lot of local capacity is in these in these reactionary um, political movements. So when I when I talk about uh, 
you know, civic capacity, the low capacity of civic organizations. I'm often talking about the low capacity of either, you know, of progressive organizations, of uh, organizations in um, poor community, poor suburban communities and uh, communities of color in the suburbs. Um, the, you know, those overlapping groups. And I think that those are the organizations that I think need to be, whose work needs to be expanded. Um, on whether the, uh, uh, the, the progressive energy is really coming from the top down, I'm, I'm less sure about that. Um, and although I really, I mean, just to take an example, I mean, I, I admire a lot of the work, you know, is, is the video camera still on? I, I admire a lot of work that the RPA does. Um, but I do think that it, it um, remains not just a, a, a top-down or organization, but also a relatively um, city-centric organization. And I think that uh, one of its failings is really that it hasn't um, reached out to the progressive groups, at least on Long Island, that are doing, you know, are trying to do a lot of this work and are kind of these, you know, fledgling little, you know, community groups with um, almost no budget often no staff, you know, and yet they're not considered, uh, I guess, major enough players to be, you know, invited to that table. And so who ends up at the table are, you know, the enlightened, uh, you know, smart growth advocates and new regionalists of the, you know, that constitute bodies like the RPA. I mean, I, again, I think the RPA is well-intentioned. I think they do a lot of good work, but I still feel like there's a missed opportunity here. Okay. Thank you. And yes. And uh, I, I, would, I would ask you to be very brief in your Sorry. answer because we, uh, we're getting, okay. Yeah. So Chris again, just to ask what you uh, think about the mayor, mayor debates the, um, and if Bloomberg's end will have any sort of shift in the governance of New York and urbanism. <laughs> The I'm sorry. Could you okay. repeat? Well, well, once again, I will ask for one more question, and we will finish this. Okay. I will collect one more question. Sure. Could I just ask that I, I missed the first part of that question? The, the something debates. The debates during the mayor mayoral. Debates. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And so we can collect one more question. Yeah, I know. There's one more question. Let's take. Um. Uh, the question that I have is that, uh, and this is an issue that both of you have raised, is uh, uh, greater involvement from private actors, and that uh, certainly with uh, shaping investment, that uh, government, uh, formalized government, is putting a, a high priority on bringing in private actors who, by virtue of their pride of place, are able to make decisions that put them above uh, civic, uh, civic actors, social uh, grassroots actors. And I wonder uh, if, if you see that as a, a what kind of factor that you could see that would envision to counteract or, or counterbalance that? Okay. Um, so, uh, in terms of the the mayoral election, um, I think that short answer on the mayoral election. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really not sure what its impact will be on the on the suburbs. I mean, I have my I have my own take on the way it'll affect the city. I, I think that we, uh, in the election of De Blasio, we see kind of a uh, uh, kind of a populist sort of uh, two New Yorks anti technocratic sort of um, uh, political up, upswelling, but uh, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about its implications for, for the suburbs. Um, I've long been struck, at least on Long Island, how the, the politics of, of New York seems so, um, seem so fragmented and that you know, it's really almost sometimes that it seems like Long Island ends uh, geographically you know, kind of right at the edge of the, of the Queens border. You know, there's, a, like there's a channel there or something. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the effect the mayoral of election is going to have on, on the suburbs. Um, I think that uh, with regard to the, the second question about the, you know, the private actors, you know, I, I think that in many cases, I mean, I, I think that part of the answer is going to be, um, again, trying to strengthen these, these local progressive organizations. I think another part of the answer is, um, in fact, rebuilding some state capacity, which has just been, you know, hollowed out at every scale in the U.S., both over the long term and then it, it, the process has accelerated in the last 
uh, five or six years, because for as long as the, uh, the, we run governments at local and state levels on a shoestring, they're going to be in thrall, I think, to the prerogatives of capital and large developers and not have much bargaining power to resist development they don't like. One minute. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I think it's a really important question. I don't know if we can be very prescriptive about this, you know. I, I do think that there are things we can do. There are lots of things we know we can, we have done. One thing that I notice, for instance, is in South America, when you go to lots of countries in South America, they have mechanisms of democracy and engagement of populations that are called populist in some instances, but that certainly draw the people in the politics of issues. And also another thing that I noticed is, for instance, in a city that I know then very well because I've done lots of research on it, which is Vancouver, um, the downtown east side issues, for instance, housing issues, were not solved until perceived as a citywide problem. And that as long as they were dealt with as a neighborhood issue, they were not resolved. And Robertson is the only one who basically said housing, housing, but housing is a Vancouver issue. It's not just the downtown east side. And suddenly the whole thing was unraveled and he's starting to implement new policies with huge support from the middle class, right? Uh, so when we look at this, basically we're rediscovering mechanisms that are not just institutionalized and the traditional governance mechanisms that we look at, right? But we are basically looking at participation, engagement, and forms of engagements that are not always regulated, like for planning, right? Uh, consultations, and so on and so forth, that go way beyond, that reinvent basically local politics. Another thing that I very often think is that we should like conflicts at the local level instead of being afraid of conflicts. <clears throat> and obviously, we should like conflict and we should embrace conflict as a way to build the future. Uh, but you know, that's a prescriptive comment and that's why in, in my talk I start with you know, my precious city and I have a picture of basically you know, destructions and fights next to it. It's because these are the illustrations of the constructions of the great city. Right? The great city is a place where large, important and deadly conflicts have basically been resolved to make a better place for tomorrow. So, thank you. Okay, I think that we will uh, stop here. I, I thank again the, the two uh, speakers for the stimulating talks, and um, we will uh, we, we're, we're uh, ending the, this panel now.